I call the Honourable Member for Lingiari. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's uh, indeed a great honour and privilege to be at the dispatch box today to contribute to this uh, fine debate, or should I say, discussion. And can I commend all who have spoken for their eloquence and indeed their reverence uh, for the occasion, but most importantly for recognising the greatness of Gough Whitlam. I have no doubt uh, that, uh, and all the speeches have reflected it thus far, uh, that his efforts made unprecedented transformational change to our national government and to an Australian society. He changed forever the architecture of Australian public policy. And we would not be, in my view, the proud and confident nation we are today without his genius. Now, I uh, was a student at the Australian National University in the early 1970s. Uh, and as a part-time job, I used to drive cabs. And quite often, I'd be driving past Parliament House in the evening. I'd note, note and those younger members won't know this, but the red and green lights would be on above the Parliament. And I'd just stop by. And I'd go in and sit in the Speaker's Gallery and watch debate. Other days I'd turn up at question time and watch the performance of this great man. Later, in 1973, I was engaged as a research assistant on a book about the Whitlam government, Out of the Wilderness, by Clem Lloyd and Gordon Reid. So I got to see at first hand, in terms of my research, the top job that I had, the dynamism of the legislative agenda of the Whitlam government. And so I stand here as someone who was of a generation, and there aren't many left in this place, with great respect to the member for Barawa, uh, who uh, can appreciate, I think, what that parliament was really like. Uh, and I say uh, to all of those who might be listening, to all of those who've got an opportunity just to look at what happened then and what happens now and understand there is a difference. Now, I want to just refer to Gough's early days in Gove and, indeed, the deputy leader, the, uh, the leader of the National Party uh, all referred to it, as did my friend, the member for Jagger Jagger. Uh, Gough was stationed at Gove Airstrip with No. 13 Squadron in 1944 uh, for a number of months, and he met and established deep friendships with the Marika and Unipingu families, and I'll come to that a little later. But as uh, the member for Jagger Jagger said, this was the site of one of Gough's first political campaigns in support of Labor Prime Minister John Curtin's 1944 referendum on post-war reconstruction and democratic rights. Sadly, it went down, and Gough fondly remembered later, later saying, our squadron and other members of the forces voted in favour, but the civilians let us down. One of the powers proposed to be transferred to the Commonwealth in that referendum had been the power to make laws for the Aboriginal race in areas of greatest need, health, social services, land tenure and adherence to international conventions. In the late 1950s, much of Gough Whitlam's vision was the result of his work on the Constitutional Review Committee in the 1950s and its recommendations. On this committee, Gough travelled the country seeing firsthand the areas of need and inconsistency of service delivery and the place of the Commonwealth to make provision for services and opportunities for all Australians. For instance, it was the Constitutional Review Committee that recommended the repeal of section 127 of the Constitution, the exclusion of Aboriginal Australians from the census. And of course, it wasn't until 1967 uh, that that happened a decade later. And of course, then in 1967, soon after becoming leader of the Labor Party, Gough returned to Gove to investigate all aspects of northern development and resource development. In his own words, he said at the time, I went to see firsthand the water, mineral and agricultural, pastoral and fishing resources and surface communications. 
he made visits right across the Northern Territory. And in 1972, the Whitlam government established the first Department of the Capital Territory and the Northern Territory, later to become the first ever Australian Department of Northern Development and the first Australian Department on Northern Australia. And Gough, as we've heard previously, was also a driver for Senate representation for the ACT and the Northern Territory. It's worth noting that the Senate Representation of Territories Act 1974, opposed by Conservative governments in New South Wales and Queensland and Western Australia on the ground, the Territorians could not have Senators voting in a state's house. But the policy area that I think that Gough Whitlam uh, affected some of them, his most trans transformational change was in the area of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights. In his 1972 campaign speech, he said, inequality suffered by Aboriginal people should cause Australians an unrelenting and deep, determined anger. He'd said legislation to give Aborigines land rights, we do that not just because their case is beyond argument, but because all of us, Australians, are diminished while the Aborigines are denied their rightful place in this nation. It was in 1973 that he established the Woodward Royal Commission, which was the forerunner to the drafting of the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, which was subsequently passed by the Fraser government in 1976. And then in August 1975, Gough Whitlam, as we've seen, handed Vincent Lingiari, the charismatic leader of the Gurindji, title to 800 square a kilometre, square miles in those days of their traditional lands. And it's worth noting that during the course of that handover, Gough said the following. I want to promise you that this set of restitution, this act of restitution, which we perform today, will not stand alone. Your fight was not for yourselves alone, and we are determined that Aboriginal Australians everywhere will be helped by it. And then, of course, he said, Vincent Lingiari, I solemnly hand to you these deeds as proof in Australian law that these lands belong to the Gurindji people, and I put into your hands part of the earth as, as itself as a sign that this land will be the possession of you and your children forever. And of course, old Vincent's response was very simple. We be mates now. Now, it's understood the impact of this on Australian political life and what it's meant for Australian political history. And it's understood now by all Australians, I think, as a result of the genius of Gough Whitlam and his team about the importance of establishing forevermore the place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in our lives. And for giving restitution and understanding, not the black armband of history, a black armband view of history, but the reality that went, was so wrong in evidence in our past. I had today a message received from the Gurindji, and it says, very sad we lost that old man, but good because now people all over Australia will be reminded of his great legacy and the great thing he did with our leader, Mr Lingiari. That old Maluka, old man, understood our important role in land rights we will meet to go today to plan how we will mourn him. Of course, this is not the only thing he did in this space. As the member for Jagger Jagger said, he established the Aboriginal Land Fund and Aboriginal Loans Commission. He passed legislation that abolished discriminatory treatment of Aborigines and override the discriminatory laws of the Bielke Peterson government. He passed the Racial Discrimination Act to ensure Aboriginal people could not be discriminated against with regard uh, to employment, pay and working conditions, equal treatment uh, before the law, access to housing and accommodation and access to goods and services. He amended the Migration Act, well, 
shouldn't be a surprise, but what, did he, what was part of this do? Well, part of his amendment was to abolish the provision, this provision that existed in his when his government came to power that required Aboriginal people to apply for special permission to leave the country. He funded Ag Aboriginal legal aid services for people and established the Aboriginal Legal Service. And when he passed the Racial Discrimination Act, he said at the proclamation of the RDA, he said the following. The main sufferers in Australian society, the main victims of social deprivation and restricted opportunity, have been the oldest Australians on the one hand and the newest Australians on the other. We stand in your debt. By this act, we shall be doing, you, your, doing our best to redress past injustice and build a more just and tolerant future. But he didn't stop there. Importantly, he reformed the Australia Council, broadening ordinary Australians' access to arts, funding which would have been largely the exclusive right of the wealthy and elite art groups. And what he did as part of this was found the Aboriginal Arts Board under its first chair, Dr Wanjak Marika from Yirrkala. This in turn enabled the flourishing of, the one, great, of one of the great international arts movements in the, last, in the last century, the Aboriginal artists of the Central Desert and Top End, and produced the internationally recognised masters such as Clifford Possum and others. His great reforms for local government meant that territory local governments received Commonwealth funding for the first time. He established the first Department of Aboriginal Affairs. He made such great change, such great change, which will for, which, for which we will be forever indebted. But that wasn't the only thing. Was, of course, he's done so much more, and you've heard it all this morning. But he did other, some other very significant things about Northern Australia. It was he who, on Christmas in 1974, responded to Cyclone Tracy. It was he who appointed Major General Stretton with broad powers to safeguard and evacuate the people of Darwin. Of course, he put off a trip to Greece to make sure he could attend to these functions. He established the Darwin Reconstruction Commission under Clem Jones, the former can-do Lord Mayor of Brisbane, to begin the reconstruction of Darwin, creating the modern city of Darwin today. Whitlam pledged a determined and unremitting effort to rebuild your city and relieve suffering. And he did, he did that. Now, others have spoken about other aspects of his life. But as the member for Lingiari and previously the member for the Northern Territory, I felt it was incumbent on me to talk about his contribution to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. What he did was put down a marker. What he did was to change the way we relate to one another. What he did was forever change that relationship. And it won't matter whatever others do, despite what others might want to do, even in current times. The fact is, those changes will last forever. And we can be proud of being members of this parliament. And we've spoken today about the nature of this place. But we ought to be proud as parliamentarians of the work which has been done across the divide. And the Aboriginal Land Rights Act was one such piece of work. And we should be proud of the contribution we have made and can continue to make by working collaboratively together in a bipartisan way to support those interests into the future. I want to extend my sympathies to Catherine, uh, Nicholas, Tony and Stephen on behalf of myself, my family and the community of the Northern Territory. In 2001, Gough came to Alice Springs. He came to Alice Springs to visit Ewan Damu, which is you know, 300 k's up the road, dirt road, not a very pleasant trip. Uh, and he was there to open an aged care facility. And I well remember that day with he and Margaret, and Margaret with the stick, actually, as the member for Sydney said, reminding Gough that it's time. Uh, and he did. Uh, but he was so generous, ever so generous, to those people he worked with. Uh, it's been a great honour and privilege for me to be able to participate in this debate. Yeah.